Welcome to our live webcast, Five Pediatric Orthopedic Conditions Not to Miss as a Primary Care Practitioner. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jesse, and I will be the operator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you may have. During the presentation, you will see multiple choice polling questions throughout the event. To participate in the polls, please select the buttons to the left of the answer that best represent your views or experiences. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see the text chat window. There is a large window which holds all of your sent messages and a smaller text box at the bottom where you will type in your questions. To send a question, click in the text box and type your text. When finished, click the send button. All questions that you submit are only seen by today's presenters, so please send them in as they come up. At the conclusion of today's program, we ask that you complete a brief CME evaluation summary form. Please take a moment to complete this form in order to receive credit for attending the webinar and providing feedback of the webinar. We are joined today by our speaker, Dr. Ellen Dean Davis. At this time, I would like to turn the microphone over to our speaker, Dr. Ellen Dean Davis. Thanks a lot, Jesse. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us um, uh, so late in the evening after what I'm sure was a long day of work for everyone. Um, so you know, in this world where everything's a bit uh, impersonal now, we're doing these things remotely, um, I'll introduce myself and tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. I actually uh, grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, and then did my uh, orthopedic training in Patterson, New Jersey, um, then followed suit with a pediatric orthopedic fellowship in Wilmington, Delaware, um, and then really kind of fell in love with the Northeast and never really wanted to go back down south, um, and I didn't really have the accent to go back down south with. So uh, here we are. I couldn't be happier to be uh, practicing um, in New Jersey and with Atlantic Health System, particularly Morristown. Um, about half of my practice is dealing with uh, trauma and kind of sports injuries, broken bones, ankle sprains, ACL tears, et cetera. Probably about another 25% is um, congenital issues uh, like DDH, uh, scoliosis, those types of things. And then probably the final 25% uh, is uh, more complex uh, deformity correction and neuromuscular conditions such as cerebral palsy. Um, so that's a little bit about me. We're now going to talk, uh, we're going to go into talking about five conditions um, that as a primary care practitioner that sees kids, uh, you know, we, we don't want to miss. And let's get this going here. So um, I don't have any disclosures relevant to this talk, but this is a little bit of do as I say, not as I do. These are my kids uh, on a trampoline and um, then also my kids riding their skateboards. So add the monkey bars in and you got the trifecta. This was, you know, what will put them through school at some point. So this is the first, uh, we'll get right into it here. This is the uh, first polling question. Uh, so, Jesse, you're going to... Yes, thank you. I would like to present you with the first polling question. To participate in the poll, please select the button to the left of the answer that best represents your views or experiences. This will be the only time I remind you of the polling questions. Thank you. Okay, so this first uh, question that will introduce the topic is a 14-year-old overweight boy complains of vague left knee and thigh pain that worsens with activity. There was no trauma that he can remember. Uh, when you're examining him, he has an antalgic gait and increased external rotation of his left foot when he's walking compared to the other side. You did order some knee x-rays, which are negative. So what's your next step here? And we'll give a couple seconds before we move on. Okay. All right. So we're going to order hip and pelvis x-rays, um, and that is the correct answer. So we'll get back into the talk now, Jesse. All right. So, and why are we going to order hip, and hip or pelvis x-rays? The answer is because we're worried about a split capital femoral epiphysis, otherwise uh, more commonly known as a skippy. Uh, 
So what is a skiffy? It's a transficial fracture through the proximal femoral growth plate. So the proximal femoral growth plate is right here, it's what's shown in blue here, and it, gr it gradually will shift or move over time. Uh, and this is the most common hip disorder in adolescents. It affects about one in every 10,000 kids, so it's pretty common. Uh, males are more affected than females. It's most commonly seen in African Americans. And these are the kind of teenagers, the young teens that this happens to. Um, and the number one greatest risk factor is obesity or even just overweight. And these kids will present with some, it's not always super painful. A lot of times it's more discomfort. And it's kind of vague, it's throughout the groin, it's kind of through the thigh. Uh, and even up to 25% of these kids will present with more of a knee pain or a distal thigh pain that's referred. And they will come in with a limp that's oftentimes painless. So probably one of the more common reasons, presentations that I see in my office is that the, the parent comes in saying, my kid's just walking funny. They're walking a, a bit different. And so, you know, looking at the physical exam for Skiffy, uh, the, the biggest thing is, you know, watching them walk. The leg will be externally rotated. So if they're complaining of this, if they kind of fit the picture, they're uh, the heavy, uh, obese kid that has this kind of vague pain, just have them walk up and down the hall. If that foot is turning out to the side, it's almost always a skiffy. And that's what we're seeing here, this boy laying on the table. This, uh, let me get my little pointer, this is the affected side, or these, this is the normal side here. This is the affected side rolled out like that. So when it slips, uh, just because of the anatomy, they're going to lose internal rotation, flexion, and abduction. So they might have a difficulty sitting in a chair because they lose flexion. They have to have the hip a bit extended. Um, and again, the leg will be held. So that really just boils down to the leg being held in external rotation. Uh, and this is absolutely pathognomonic, this obligate external rotation of the hip with hip flexion. Absolute pathognomonic for Skiffy. So what is that? Looking at this bottom picture here, the uh, practitioner is flexing the knee towards the chest. So flexing the hip and knee towards the chest. And it's going in a straight line this way. This is the affected side on this uh, pathologic picture, where the hip is being flexed up and the leg is being externally rotated as it's flexed up. And, and that's something that they can't fake. So when we're talking about Skippy, um, we're talking about there's really like two flavors, I say, of Skippy. One is there's an abnormal load on a normal growth plate. The growth plate is totally fine, it's just carrying too much weight. And that's when you see, that's why it's most commonly with these obese children. Then you have the less common, but not to be forgotten, normal load on an abnormal growth plate. There's something wrong with the growth plate, so it's not a weight issue, it's a growth plate issue. And that happens with endocrine disorders, most commonly hypothyroid. Um, it can be hyperparathyroid. There can be growth hormone issues. Even with growth hormone treatment, we're seeing a little bit more of this because it seems to be more common. Um, there's some question of whether or not vitamin D deficiency can lead to this, um, and that's still being studied and developed. Uh, also, children that have had history of prior radiation are at risk for this. And this boy here has renal osteodystrophy. So amongst other issues or problems that he had, you know, this is a pretty dramatic deformity, he had split capital femoral epiphysis here. So you can see that the um, bone is very washed out. It's, uh, it looks osteopenic, um, and there almost is like this 
lucency right by the growth plate here, uh, and that's a chronic skippy. So when we're diagnosing this, uh, one of the big things is, so this is diagnosed on plain x-ray. You don't need much more than that. Um, one of the big take-homes here is don't just get the hip. You have to get the, the pelvis, both an AP and a frog lateral pelvis. Frog lateral pelvis is where you're going to see this uh, or, or most easily diagnose this. And this is an example of that. This is a very subtle skippy where it's a little bit small here, but the metathesis comes up here, and it doesn't quite match up with the uh, femoral head here. It's, we, it's described as a scoop of ice cream is the uh, femoral head, and it's just sliding off of the cone. Uh, but that's pretty difficult to diagnose unless you get the uh, other side. So you have a direct basis of comparison. So this a picture on the bottom is the same one on the top. The picture on the top was actually missed by a very good radiologist, um, but when you have a side-to-side -side comparison, it's very difficult. It, it or makes the diagnosis much more clear. Um, and then the it can be dosed, diagnosed on an MRI if needed. And the only time you really need to look uh, or do an MRI is if if the kid looks the part. If it's an obese kid, has the vague hip pain, maybe walking in a little bit of external rotation, um, and you're kind of convinced but the x-rays are negative, an MRI can diagnose what's like called a pre-slip, which is basically edema, inflammation, irritation of the growth plate that precedes the actual slip. So it would be best case scenario to kind of catch it at this phase. And so we talk about the, the two flavors and the, the, uh, the, the more, uh, the rarer form of a skippy being the uh, normal load on the abnormal growth plane. So who do you work up for that? And that's the younger than expected, so really under 10, older than expected, which would be older than 16, and then any kids who um, just don't kind of fit the picture of uh, the obesity uh, as most common uh, calls it a factor. And so how do we treat it? Well, it's honestly, it's pretty simple. We put a screw <laughs> across the growth plate. And the purpose of that, it's like a peg. We just want the, we, we're not trying to correct the skippy. We just don't want it to get any worse. Um, so by putting a screw right across the growth plate here, uh, it will prevent it, the vast majority of times, from getting any worse. And so post-operatively, these kids are usually toe-touch weight-bearing for about six weeks. If it's both sides that it is affected at once, then we'll let them bear weight, but really just for like transfer purposes. Um, and then the big thing is uh, no contact sports until maturity. So you try to encourage exercise and weight loss, but not in the contact sport um, realm, which can be a little bit tricky because that's what they usually want to do. And the reason we care, the reason why, you know, like why, why is this something not to miss? Because this is a very mild skippy. The uh, ice cream scoop hasn't completely come off of the cone. Um, but we don't want that to become this. Because once this happens, and it's not just a little slip, it's a lot of slip, um, Really, so, you know, the only answer oftentimes is a hip replacement, and nobody wants a hip replacement in a really young kid. So in follow-up for Skiffy, and this is very important as primary care uh, practitioners because you're going to see them a lot more than I'm going to see them. They're kind of your go-to uh, when, when they have an issue. And so it's important to always ask about any kind of hip pain, groin pain, knee pain, thigh pain. And the reason is because even though if, if they had a diagnosis of a skippy and it had surgery for it, about 1% to 2% of these will continue to slip over time. Uh, so we want to deal with that if we have to before it becomes a problem. Um, the other thing is you can have a contralateral slip. So somewhere in, around a third of the time, the other side will also develop a skippy. 
most of those happen within one year, or at least half of them happen within one year uh, from the first one's diagnosis. Um, and then I follow them about every three months. And reason being, I'm looking for, again, see if it's happening on the other side, make sure that the screw that we put across uh, the growth plate is actually doing what it should. And then also evaluating for avascular necrosis because that's sort of the most feared complication in one of those severe splits like you see here. Um, that, you can get AVN in these types for uh, even up to 50% of the time, and that's a really tough problem in a young kid. So that's really what we're trying to avoid here. All right, you know what, let's go back one. Are there any questions related to Skippy? Um, that's one thing that I wanted to actually mention before. If uh, let's try to do some questions to make this a little bit more interactive. Um, so any questions they have, just keep them rolling in, and we'll try to address it after each little topic here. So I have one question here, um, which is if I suspect a skiffy based on physical exam and risk factors. Should I send for an x-ray first or send directly to orthopedics? Um, that's a great question. So I would say if you're worried about it in your office, I mean, we can do x-ray in the office, so it's kind of like a twofer. Um, so I would say if, if available, uh, you know, daytime hours, we can always fit people in last second. If you're worried about it, you send them right over to us because we can do the x-ray, make the diagnosis. and if they have it, I send them basically straight to the emergency room because I don't want them, if it's a small little slip, I don't want to, um, you know, them to walk out of my office, trip on the curb, and then make it like a bigger deal um, with all those complications we talked about. Um, if it's more like a weekend situation, after hour situation, you can't get them in, then I say um, go straight to the emergency room if you're highly concerned. Um, Another question is, are you operating immediately on an MRI that shows Fifield edema? Uh, yes. The answer is really yes, because again, you don't want them walking out, playing football, ending up with the picture you see here on the slide. Um, you want to prevent that uh, problem. And there's no real amount of like rest that's going to cure it. One, another question here is, is there a genetic component or family history? Um, not, there is no genetic component or, and really family history doesn't necessarily play into it aside from you tend to see obesity running in families or other, you know, uh, like renal osteodystrophy sometimes will run in families, et cetera. So the underlying um, uh, reason for the skippy may be kind of genetic, but not the actual skippy itself. Um, okay, I think we'll keep going for now, and we'll also have some time at the end to hit some questions uh, if you guys want to stick around and are interested. So the next uh, polling question will come up now, and that is, uh, a mother brings her three-year-old child in for an evaluation because the child is walking on his toes. He began walking a little late, 26 months and is always walking with those. Upon further questioning, mother reports uh, that with his birth history, he was born at 30 weeks, he's been delayed in motor milestones, and when you examine him, you sense that there's some stiffness in the Achilles tendon from dorsiflexion in the ankle. What is the most likely diagnosis? I'll give a second, and I will preface this by saying it's probably not the most fair question. Um, because you probably need a little bit more information to make the diagnosis. Oh, but you guys are killing it, so. All right, we'll give about five seconds. All right, good. So, yes, diplegic cerebral palsy is the answer. Um, okay, so we'll go back to the talk here. So, the answer, diplegic cerebral palsy, and we'll, call it, we'll talk about why. 
So the next thing we're talking about is toe walking. Um, and so with toe walking, we're going to go ahead and say most of them are idiopathic or habitual toe walkers. But we're not talking about those here. The, the things we don't want to miss are underlying issues such as muscular dystrophy, cerebral palsy, or other neurologic causes. So just a word on idiopathic toe walking or habitual toe walking. Really, really common. Most babies will outgrow it by the time they're two. Um, if they're still walking on their toes by the time they're two, most of those resolve by uh, the time they're five. Um, and, you know, we could talk for like a whole hour about do you treat habitual toe walkers at what age, what do you do, et cetera, but that's not really the point here. The point here is to figure out the what not to miss. So here, when we're, when we're asking the questions, I mean, the history is really key here. Um, idiopathics are otherwise developmentally normal. When you tell them to walk flat, they can walk flat and, uh, you know, they respond to that command. And usually they've kind of, parents are like, they've always walked on their toes. It's not something that develops on their, uh, um, over time. And then there's going to be a normal neurologic exam, obviously. So when is it not normal? Well, these other conditions that we're about to talk about briefly. So in cerebral palsy, most commonly will be uh, spastic diplegia. And this, for me, is one of the, the um, first presentations of cerebral palsy. So we actually make diagnosis of cerebral palsy based on kids coming in for toe walking. So as we know, cerebral palsy is some type of insult to an immature brain. The brain injury doesn't change, but the physical manifestations change as kids grow. So in obtaining the history, birth history is super important because prematurity is the most common risk factor, along with perinatal infections and a laundry list of other things. And when we're talking about their toe walking history, uh, it is oftentimes delayed walking, but not necessarily by so much that it has like lots of triggers uh, for you. And then these are ones that, again, have always walked on their toes, much like the habitual. The difference here is that they develop uh, a heel cord contracture and they have some element of spasticity. So when you're testing the heel cord, you're trying to, uh, let me get this thing up here. You're dorsiflexing the ankle. And if it is not freely able to just go up at least 25 degrees or so, that's a heel cord contracture. To be able to kind of walk in a normal fashion with like a normal heel to toe gait, you need at least 10 degrees of dorsiflexion. And then also looking for spasticity. So when we rapidly try to dorsiflex our foot or rapidly flex our knee, it almost has this catch or this little bit of, it just doesn't go smoothly. And again, they'll also sometimes have wrist reflexes. And kids with a heel cord contracture due to cerebral palsy or any other problem can't do this duck walk. So you can see here, um, to be able to get down into this position, you need at least 15 to 20 degrees of ankle dorsiflexion. If you can't do that, that's a heel cord contraction. Uh, you won't be able to do that if you have a heel cord contraction. And so treatment for toe walking with cerebral palsy is really preventative. Um, it's, it's making a diagnosis to get them the proper therapy, et cetera, that they need. So you really, you just stretch them, stretch them, stretch them, especially as they're growing fast. And sometimes we supplement that with uh, an ankle foot orthosis, basically a brace that does not allow plantar flexion, but will allow dorsiflexion. Um, and then if they do develop the heel cord contracture, that can be managed in any host of ways, depending on the severity, whether it be serial casting, Botox, or uh, very rarely now we have to go to surgery for something like this because um, the neurologists and physiatrists kind of keep us out of surgery territory uh, by doing the other stuff like the Botox. Um, but really, the treatment, you know, we can deal with the toe walking. It's more about making the diagnosis to get them all the other stuff that they need. Now, toe walking with muscular dystrophy is also sometimes the most, the, the presenting complaint uh, or, or the presenting feature of someone who ends up being diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. Now with the history here, very different. They've started walking totally normal. 
and then they've gradually slowed down. They aren't able to keep up with their peers. They have some fatigue, um, and they may be a bit clumsy, and then they start toe walking. And, you know, these kids kind of fit the picture. It's excellent and recessive, so oftentimes there's a positive family history if you dig around and ask. Um, this is only boys. Usually they start toe walking anywhere from two to six years old and uh, because of this genetic defect. Um, so why do they toe walk? Well, so with muscular dystrophy, the proximal muscles are weak before the distal muscles. So um, usually when I give this kind of talk in person, have everybody like stand up and do it. Um, so feel free to do it at home. But basically, you have gluteal weakness which means you're not able to hold yourself upright. So you flex at the knee a little bit. And so that you don't fall flat on your face, then you increase your lumbar lordosis and bring yourself back up. If you try to walk right now with flex at the hip and arched through the back, it's very unstable. So kids go up onto their toes for balance here and so that they can get around. So how do we treat this toe walk? Well, we don't. We let them toe walk. You take away the toe walking, they stop walking. You want to prevent a heel cord contracture, but let them toe walk. Um, the bigger thing about this is making the diagnosis. We can deal with the toe walk, not a big deal, but making the diagnosis so that they can get started on the proper therapies they need to slow their disease progression. And then other neurologic etiologies, um, these are, are sort of like the red flag. So this is, these are things like tethered cord, uh, syringomyelia, um, spastic uh, hereditary uh, paresis, um, spinal cord tumors, et cetera. The history for this is usually that they were walking, normal, walking normally, but then it progressively gets worse, but without kind of the clumsiness and fatigue that is associated with muscular dystrophy. And these kids are often like a little bit older than the kids being diagnosed with muscular dystrophy as well. And any time there is unilateral toe walking or asymmetric kind of toe walking, one's a little, one ankle's a little tight, the other one's not as tight, um, that is a, a, an absolute red flag. And so on examining uh, them, they may have clonus, they may have some hyperreflexia, uh, they will have some spasticity at times. Uh, I always, always, always check abdominal reflexes, and um, I think one of the easiest things to check in the office is uh, asymmetry of popliteal angles. So this is a popliteal angle here, flexing the hip to 90 degrees, and then tr while the other leg, it's really important, the other leg has to stay completely straight. Flex the hip to 90 degrees, and then try to bring the foot from here up to here, up to the ceiling. And I don't really care, and this, this basically is a, a test of how tight your hamstrings are. And I don't really care what the number is or the angle is, but what I'm looking for is symmetry or asymmetry. If it's asymmetric, that's kind of a big red flag, and it's really easy to see with your eyes, too. So when any of these are suspected, um, we're looking at, we're, we end up doing an MRI of the entire spine, plus or minus the brain. I oftentimes will have uh, our neurologists who are awesome here kind of double check me on some of these and see if it's absolutely necessary because with these kids oftentimes you have to um, sedate them uh, or anesthetize them and you don't want to do that unless you're like pretty darn sure it needs to be done. So oftentimes we'll get neurology to kind of back us up or see if it needs to have the brain included, etc. Um, so that's it on toe walking. Any other questions on toe walking? Nothing coming in there. Okay. Um, so then the next polling question. A four-year-old girl fell off of her scooter onto an outstretched arm. She cried for an hour after the fall, but then calmed down. The following day, her parents noticed that she was avoiding using the arm. She was brought to the ER where this x-ray was obtained. What is the diagnosis? Can you show the x-ray, Jesse? Can you scoot that the bowling thing over? Yeah, there you go. So that's the x-ray there. So what are we looking at? 
All right. Give it about five seconds or so. Okay, good. So um, now, <laughs> so most commonly, this will be a supracondylar humerus fracture, but actually not in this case, and we'll go over why. So by in the next 10 minutes or so, you'll never miss this again. Um, so we can go back to the talk here. So this is actually a Montasia fracture. So a Montasia fracture, it's just an easier way, uh, or a fancier way at least, um, to say a fracture of the ulna with dislocation of the radial head. So fracture of the ulna and then dislocation of the radial head. Um, so what this is, you know, this, nobody's going to miss this fracture, right? So the radial head is dislocated, uh, but that's going to get picked up at some point uh, because this is going to be treated. What we don't want to miss here is the more subtle Montasia fracture dislocation. So the ulna here is just a little bit bent. It's not really, it doesn't look as dramatic as this one. It's a little bit bent, but in doing so, the radial head popped out of place. And when you're talking about forearm fractures in general, uh, it's hard to break just one. It's, it's much more common to break both or to have something happen to both bones rather than just one. Um, it's almost like if you have like a pretzel and try to break it in just one spot, it's like almost impossible to do. Uh, so it more often than not affects both bones of the forearm whether it's a fracture or a dislocation. So these are kind of, they're in the same uh, demographic as like a supracondylar fracture or a buccal fracture of the distal radius, and they kind of happen the same way. So these can be missed. So these are like four to 10-ish year old kids who fall onto the outstretched upper extremity. And the exam can be anything from like that dramatic deformity, like the first x-ray we saw, to just like this little bit sore, a little bit swollen, and they may or may not have loss of elbow flexion and extension. Uh, they may not have as much pronation and supination, but that's like very hard to tell on a kid who doesn't want you touching them because they've had this injury and they're scared. Um, so you kind of got to be on the lookout for this. So to diagnose this, we need to know a little bit about pediatric elbow anatomy. So um, with there's all these little ossification centers in a kid's elbow. And so these show up at different times on an x-ray, which is oftentimes why things are confusing and can be diagnosed or confused with fracture versus regular growth plate. So the capitellum is probably the most important thing to point out here. It's this thing here. So it's on the lateral side of the distal humerus. On the, on the lateral x-ray, it looks like this kind of almost like little ball. Um, and that shows up around one year of age. The radial head follows suit at around four, and then they each follow, you know, and there's a range of ages when these show up, but kind of about four, six, eight, ten, and twelve years old between the uh, medial epicondyle, the trochlea, which is the medial side of the distal humerus as opposed to the capitellum being the lateral side, uh, the olecranon, and then the lateral epicondyle. And so, on x-ray, you get your AP and your lateral views of the elbow. And we know it's a good lateral view of the elbow because there's this thing called the teardrop. So if you see this outline, which looks like a teardrop, on lateral, it's a perfect lateral. Um, but if there's one thing you need to know about a Montasia fracture dislocation, it's this, the radiocapitellar line. So if you draw a line through the radius, it will intersect the capitellum, which again is this like little ball looking thing. So, and that's going to be present on the AP view, the lateral view, any weird views that they get in the emergency room just because the kid's squirming around. Uh, this line through the radius, straight through the radius, will intersect the capitellum. So, we'll go back and look at that. The this is that first x-ray we looked at. So the, the ulna is fractured, clearly, uh, but we draw a line through the radius, 
it's nowhere near the capitellum. So this is a an ulna fracture with associated radial head dislocation. It's going to get picked up on an x-ray like this that has this kind of dramatic appearance. But here's the, that same picture from before. There is a dislocation of the radial head. You see the line drawn through the radius here does not intersect the capitellum. It's way out in left field. Um, and how this happens is something called plastic deformation. So this is kind of the what not to miss. The ulna is bowed upwards. Uh, if you draw a line along the ulna, the ulna should be touching the entire length of uh, this line here. But it's bowed up just a little. And that a little bit about a bowing will cause the radial head to just pop out of place. So that's what we call plastic deformation. In kids, bones bend before they break. And they don't necessarily bend back into place. And so why do we care about this? Why is this not to miss? Because acutely, if we catch this pretty early, you know, in under two weeks or so, most of these can be dealt with with a simple cast. Or even in the emergency room, if you're in the ER, if you, almost just like a nursemaid, if you supinate the forearm, flex the elbow, you can pop the thing right back into place and you put them in a cast. Worst case, acutely, maybe you put a nail in, a, a little rod, but this can be done by like, you know, a half a centimeter incision over the tip of the elbow and it's pretty minimally invasive. Whereas if you, if this is delayed, um, we're talking about an open reduction. So we're talking about an incision, we're talking about plates and screws and then having to take them out, it becomes a bit of a bigger deal. Uh, oftentimes you actually have to cut the bone if it's partially healed and almost create a deformity in order to fix it correctly. And then chronically, which is only, you know, three weeks after, you have to end up doing this component of it, the open reduction. But then you also have to make another incision on the outside of the elbow to get the radial head back in. So it becomes a really big deal. And even when that happens, the results aren't awesome. Um, and then if it's really you know, if it's been out and, and not treated for even like six weeks, oftentimes the only, the best answer is just to leave it alone and accept that the kid will have some loss of motion because trying to put it in late or trying to fix it late just doesn't have good results. So that's kind of why we care about this and why we don't want to miss it. Um, so this is the next polling question. Oh, you know what, uh, let's see. There is a, there is a uh, hang on for the polling question for a second. There is a question about Montasia fracture. That how often do you see an isolated ulna fracture without an associated radial head dislocation? So ulna fracture only without radial head. Um, you only see this when a kid gets hit directly in the arm. So the most common, it, it's called a nightstick fracture because, um, uh, you know, back when got hit uh, by the police or whatever, um, people would hold up their arm and hit directly there as a direct impact. Um, so most commonly in my practice, I see it with lacrosse, where you get a stick directly into the um, uh, outside of the arm as they're, as they're blocking somebody. Uh, so you do see it, um, it's just not as common, but again, the history there is critical to be able to uh, parse that out. That's a good question. Um, okay, we can do the polling question now, though. Oh, so you're evaluating a week-old baby girl at her initial visit to your office. She was born at 39 weeks via C-section for breech positioning. She is the first-born baby to this family. Mother notes no known family history of hip dysplasia. However, she endorses that the baby's maternal aunt and grandmother had hip problems and needed hip replacement around 40 to 50 years old. The baby's exam is unremarkable with the exception of maybe a click. What is your next step? Uh, order a hip, that's supposed to be hip ultrasound to be performed within the next week. Order a hip ultrasound to be performed at six weeks. Have her come back to your office so you can repeat the exam or do nothing. We'll give about five more seconds. All right. All right, so the majority of people got this right. We'll go back to the talk. All right, so 
you order an ultrasound to be performed at six weeks of life, and we'll tell you why that's the case rather than uh, uh, earlier than that. So we're talking about DDH, or developmental dysplasia. They have also called congenital dysplasia. And it's really common, it's the most common orthopedic condition of all in, in newborns. Um, so about one in 100 babies has dysplasia, so you're definitely going to see this in your office. And about one in 500 will have an a, a frank dislocation. And so it's Im really important to know the risk factors here. And, and I'm a little bit preaching to the choir in terms of pediatricians because you guys do an amazing job of uh, screening these and appropriately dealing with them and referring them or getting ultrasounds, et cetera. Um, and so, I mean, at, at this point um, in the United States, a hip dislocation is almost like like a never event practically, um, thanks uh, to you guys and, and the good work that you do. So the risk factors are firstborn, female, most of them, 80% are female. Um, kind of like a more solid risk factor is breech positioning. So you can see, especially in this picture here, the femoral heads are pointing nowhere near the acetabulum. They're basically the opposite way. Um, so the hips never really have a chance to form correctly. And then uh, positive family history is another big one here. There's um, some question about swaddling. Now, while it may not cause hip dysplasia, if there is known hip dysplasia or at risk for hip dysplasia, it can worsen the problem. So for diagnosing these, uh, there is basically you're relying on your physical exam and imaging based on screen uh, risk factors. So, and by imaging, an ultrasound if they're under four months, an x-ray if they're over six months. And the in-between we'll talk about. So, uh, who do you screen? So, well, the answer, and we'll get into that, but universal screening isn't accepted because there are way too many false positives. And treatment, most of the time it's benign. It has some risk. There's risk of brachial plexus palsy if the pavlic harness is too tight around the, uh, around the shoulders. There's risk of femoral nerve palsy, um, which if we play this video here, you'll see. This is a baby uh, recently that's being treated for hip dysplasia. Um, and it, for reasons that aren't quite clear, um, the femoral nerve basically stopped working. So on the left, you can see that the baby's kicking, extending the knee, that means the femoral nerve is working, but on the right, um, it's held in flexion. She's not able to extend the uh, leg. So that's a femoral nerve palsy. So that's something that every time a baby is being treated uh, in the office in a pelvic harness, that's something we, that's one of the reasons even we see them fairly frequently to make sure that's not going to be an issue. To treat, treat it, you basically just take them out of the harness and let it recover and they all do great. Um, so who do you screen? So this is from the American Academy of Pediatrics and um, this is like a very complex algorithm for me. Uh, and, and this is based off of your physical exam. So you guys kind of, for American Academy of Pediatrics, you have uh, broken it down into uh, your exam and then your uh, risk factors. But this seems like pretty complicated to me. Um, it is, you have to go through all these pathways. The only thing that you guys really talk about is if it's breach and a girl, like they definitely recommend it, but that's sort of the only like solid thing here. Um, so, for the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery, we like to keep things very simple. Uh, we're dumbing it down a little bit. So, we basically say we screen if there's either breach position, family history, or clinically we're worried about it based on our exam. And this gets a moderate strength of recommendation from our academy, which is basically the highest it gets for orthopedics. Uh, so, this is what we follow. And then. When do you send for the ultrasound? So that was part of the question before. Um, so if there's a positive bar low and ortolani maneuver, you basically start the treatment before you even get the ultrasound. You don't need an ultrasound to confirm it if, you're, if, if your exam is positive. Um, the screening exam should be done between four, really up to, really six weeks is better, six weeks of age, because um, all the maternal estrogen that is produced to have the baby is passed on to the baby. And that makes everything super loose. 
So there's all this laxity. So if you do the ultrasound too early, it has a really high false positive rate. So you definitely want to wait till six weeks, really. And then after um, about six months, you have to use an x-ray versus ultrasound. And there are, there are very specific ways to kind of um, position the legs. That's why we prefer just to do it in our office and have some quality control over it. You know, in that four to six month range, I still prefer an ultrasound because it's a dynamic study. You get more information rather than one moment in time with an x-ray. Um, it's a little, uh, thankfully our uh, ultrasound department is excellent and they can get awesome ultrasounds on a little bit older babies. Um, some places will have a cutoff of less than uh, four months, or uh, less than, or over four months rather. Um, and, and go straight to x-ray. But I prefer to use the ultrasound as long as I can. And on exam, there's obviously the Barlow and Ortolani maneuver. So the Barlow, you're actually dislocating the hip. And this isn't a painful thing for the baby. Um, but you're pushing it out the back. And then with an Ortolani, you abduct the hips, you bring them open, and you push it, and it uh, reduces it or puts it right back in. And there's this Galeazzi sign where you're looking for one leg being shorter than the other. So in this picture, the right leg is the affected one. Easier to diagnose in what's probably a one and a half or so year old there, maybe two year old here, versus uh, this would be the affected one here. But that's pretty subtle. Uh, that would be hard to, to diagnose. There's gluteal fold asymmetry. So this is not thigh fold asymmetry. Babies have lots of little weird fat rolls on their thighs. We're really not talking at all. I don't care really at all about the thigh fold. What I'm looking at is the gluteal fold here. So you can see it's symmetric here, even though there's some, ab, uh, some kind of asymmetric thigh folds, but we don't really care about that. We care more about the asymmetry of the gluteal fold. And then after about three months, the musculature around the hip gets a bit contracted, and the hip abduction is limited. And that's the, the kind of key diagnostic portion in a little bit of an older baby. And later on, they can start to walk funny. Um, the hip click is really, it, it's kind of a misnomer. Um, the paper that kind of first looked at Barlow and Ortolani described a clunk. And then when that was um, translated uh, into English, it became click, and this click thing is kind of perpetuated. But there's a big difference between the clunk of the Barlow and Ortolani, and if you felt it once, you know, you know what I'm talking about, um, versus the hip click. And then what we're you know, we're talking about what not to miss. Really, we don't want to miss the dislocation. The little bit of looseness or laxity, um, obviously, we don't want to miss, but this is, the, this is the big deal here. Um, and so how do we treat it? We treat it in a harness, pilot harness, which is a um, little series of straps. Basically, it keeps the femoral head pointed towards the acetabulum, and just like play on a potter's wheel, uh, if you point it in the right direction, like if you build it, they will come, you point it in the right direction, and the baby still has a bit of motion through the leg, and they can kick around. And so constantly they're just doing this, and molding and molding and molding. Uh, and you do this, I mean, short answer, you know, can't, they, the parents always want to know, how long do you do this? And, you know, the short answer is until it's better. Uh, what that usually means is 6 to 12 weeks, depending on the severity to begin with. Um, but we get ultrasounds every two to three weeks to track progress and make sure we're on the right track. And then we can give kind of better guidance as time goes on. And there's a greater than like 90 plus percent success rate, even like closer to the 100 percent success rate in a little bit of mild dysplasia. And then if they are non-responsive to tablet treatment, um, we used to go straight to this, the dreaded spica cap. Um, but now there's some good data that shows if you give them a little holiday from the uh, pavlic harness, you put them in this little bit more rigid brace, um, that they can, they can fail pavlic but then be treated with this brace before having to resort to this, even though this is what may be the end game anyway. And so why do we not want to miss it? Why do we want to diagnose it basically at birth or shortly after birth? We don't want to have this hip dislocation situation. Because the only answer to this at this age uh, is this pap this uh, spike of calf. Uh, so this baby looks happy. I'll tell you, he's not happy. The parents are not happy. Because this is a full-time job taking care of a baby in a spike of calf. Um, and 
you know, and we're talking about basically a uh, minimum of three months in this thing. So it's sort of a torture device for the parents. And ultimately, too, in an older child, a hip dislocation like this oftentimes ends up like this, with having to basically cut the bones, rearrange the bones, put it back in the socket. And once you get to that point, um, the results long term aren't awesome. Um, they're good, but they're not fantastic. So if we can avoid this in the first place, that's the uh, that's kind of the key here. Um, I think that may be enough. So the a couple questions here: um, Do double diapers do anything to help treat this dysplasia? Uh, there's there, that's kind of like an old like wives' tale, I guess. Um, people used to do it a long time ago. I don't know where it necessarily came from. It makes sense that it would work, but uh, all the studies show that it doesn't work. So you don't necessarily need to tell parents to waste a whole bunch of money on extra diapers. Um, and we'll, there's a few other questions. I think we're running a little low on time, so maybe we'll try to get to them at the end um, and, and keep on moving for people who want to get out of here right at 8.30. So the next uh, polling question here. This is an eight-year-old boy presents to your office after slamming his right middle finger in a car door four hours before he saw you. He has a subungual hematoma involving the majority of the nail bed and a finger nail that is elevated. The distal aspect of the finger is red and swollen. You order an x-ray, which reveals slight widening of the distal phalanx with no displacement. What do you do next? All right, give a couple more seconds. Okay. Awesome, yeah, so splint the finger and refer to either the emergency room or orthopedics or hand surgery or get them to somebody for fairly urgent management. That's correct. All right. So what we're talking about here is something called a Seymour fracture. So this is something that a lot of people have never even heard of. Um, so this may be the first kind of uh, initial uh, presentation of this that you've ever even seen. But it's something to kind of keep in the back of your mind. Um, so the Seymour fracture is sort of deeper than what you see on the surface. Um, it is a distal phalanx spicial fracture. So it's a fracture right through the growth plate of the distal phalanx with an associated nail bed, bed injury. And this can happen in either fingers or toes. And this really makes it an open fracture, which is kind of why it's a big deal, why you don't want to miss it. And honestly, it would be really easy to miss if you kind of just didn't even know about it or think about it. And so this happens either by like stubbing a toe, getting your finger or toe jammed during sports, so that direct trauma, or um, a crush injury most commonly like caught in the door, or caught in the hinge of a door. And so it's not always super obvious. So you see this picture up here, you have a nail bed laceration, you have some bleeding from around the nail, um, and particularly on this side there's like a little bit of a nail bed laceration. This you have your subungual hematoma, but almost more importantly you have this like bulbous appearance at the base of the nail or just proximal to the nail bed. And when you get x-rays, they, they may look normal. What you can kind of, what may clue you into something being abnormal is that there can be some widening of the growth plate at the distal phalanx here in comparison to other fingers. Um, there can be a little flexion deformity here. So you see that this portion here should be really lined up with here, but it's flexed forward. Or you can have complete disruption between of the uh, physis here, where it's almost like sheared off completely. And so why do we care about this? Why is this not to miss? Well, because uh, it, it can re result in some nail plate deformity, it can re result in a growth risk, which, you know, those are sort of cosmetic things, not too big of a deal, but really it can result in chronic osteomyelitis. And the numbers are pretty dismal with this. So this is a study done a couple years ago um, down at, uh, in uh, Texas, and 
it looked at these injuries and looked at either acute appropriate treatment, which they defined as less than 24 hours, and they get the trifecta of an IND, fracture stabilization, either with a pin or with a splint, and then uh, antibiotics. So, and that's in under 24 hours. And then acute partial treatment being under 24 hours and maybe one or two of the three things seen here. And then delayed treatment, which uh, is after 24 hours, kind of no matter what they do, IND or fracture stabilization or antibiotics. And why we care about this is because the numbers are a bit dismal. 45% infection rate, four out of the five infections are osteomyelitis here. So that's why we don't want to miss it. So when we do treat this, you have to kind of go all go big or go home. You have to do take the nail off, do a nail bed repair. You have to clean out any debris. You have to remove whatever is in the growth plate, which is also some, some periosteum or part of the nail bed itself. Um, and then you have to stabilize the fracture, whether that's just with a splint or with uh, 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 a pin sometimes, and then uh, antibiotics as well. Um, and this has to be done fairly urgently. Uh, and this all is stuff that can be done in the emergency room. It's a little tough to do it in the office just because of lack of resources for all the stuff you need. Um, but it can be done uh, quite easily in the emergency room. You don't have to go to the operating room. Uh, so we're really coming to the end of the talk here. So some of the take-home points um, that we'll go over, just with the skiffy we talked about, if you think it, then get the AP and frog pelvis x-ray. Uh, for toe walking, the history is the key, also supplemented by your uh, physical exam. Montasia, if you remember that radio capitellar line, you'll never miss it. Uh, for DDH, we really rely on the risk factors to guide screening and prevent those catastrophic problems. And then Seymour fracture, uh, if you suspect it or if you diagnose it, it really does need pretty urgent evaluation to avoid the complications. All right. Um, okay. There are we have a few minutes here, so if people want to start uh, taking off, all, great. But I'll, I'll this, I think we have a few extra minutes that they build into this, so we can uh, answer some questions. Um, the there is a question about when do you alter so for DDH when do you ultrasound a premature infant? Um, that's a good question and it's you you can still ultrasound them at six weeks after birth uh, if there is high suspicion because at that point the maternal estrogen has cleared the system and if you won't have the false positive. Um, so that's a good question, though. Um, let's see, another question. <clears throat> so uh, there's one about the toe walking. Why can't it just be a lesion in the calf? I have a relative who had an asymmetric toe walk that turned out to be a vascular anomaly called fava. Uh, it was initially believed to be short Achilles, but the lesion was picked up through MRI of the calf, which no one wanted to do for years. Um, so that's a, you know, that's a good point. You know, the, the key there is that there was asymmetric toe walking. So asymmetric toe walking just isn't normal, and you got to figure out why, why it is. So you, you know, most commonly, at least in pediatrics and where I see things, um, it's going to be due to some type of underlying neurologic thing or genetic thing. Uh, but it, it really can be anything, and it kind of it requires work up until you figure it out. So that's a good point. Uh, let's see here. Um, should every subungual hematoma trigger an X-ray? Uh, and so this is regarding the Skippy, uh, uh, or the uh, Seymour fracture discussion. Um, and I kind of, I, I had a feeling somebody was going to ask that, and I think that's a really tough question to ask. But I do think that um, anyone, not a, not a necessarily a subunculate hematoma, especially that only is maybe like less than half of the nail, 
Um, but if there is that, so if there's any kind of like active bleeding or if there's a nail bed laceration around it, or if it's just one of those that like looks a little bit nasty or has that elevation of uh, the tissue right just proximal to the nail itself, I think that should uh, have an x-ray. So another question about Skiffy is uh, if a patient comes in with only hip and knee pain but fit the characteristic of obese, would you send straight to the emergency room or get x-rays first? So um, great question. And I think we kind of touched on it a little bit before, but basically if you're worried about it and your clinical suspicion is very high, um, I would say either uh, send them I wouldn't necessarily send them for an x-ray, and then that's going to take time to read, et cetera. I would say try to get them to see us where we can do x-ray, make the diagnosis, and treat all in one felt, like one moment, um, which for me, again, always, if I see a patient, you know, so pediatrician calls me, says they're worried about it, I say send them in today, we'll get the x-rays and we'll deal with it. We get the x-ray, it's there, the diagnosis was correct then I send them straight to the emergency room um, to, because I don't want to run into any of the problems, both from, you know, from the kid's point of view, but also from a medical legal standpoint. I don't want them to develop um, a, a bad skippy when it was only a little bit of skippy. So if, you know, if you can't get them to see somebody right away, essentially, then, um, uh, then send them straight to the ER, I would say if your clinical suspicion is that high. Um, all right, I think that is, you know, the, there's a few other questions that they're telling me to wrap it up. So thank you guys for attending. And if anybody else has any other questions, um, my information will be available. I'm happy to either uh, get on the phone with you or, uh, you know, shoot you an email. Thanks, guys. All right. On behalf of Morristown Medical Center Orthopedic Surgery, I would like to thank you for your participation in today's event. A post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. Please take a moment to complete this survey in order to receive credit for attending the webinar. This concludes today's program. Thank you and have a great day.